thank you very much. May I invite uh, Sir Gordon and Mark to come up to the table over here? And uh, Sir Gordon, I don't know if you want to immediately reflect on Mark's comments. Otherwise, if you permit, we take some questions from the room and you reflect on them as you go along. Well, I'll just, just say something quickly. I, we, we hadn't, Mark and I hadn't planned this, but it's worked perfectly in the sense that I focused on sustainability and he focused on unsustainability as a way of going forward. And it's a very powerful way of going at it. I, I remember there was a man called, uh, any of you will know him, Napat Joda, a brilliant Indian uh, scientist who worked at the uh, Mountain Research Center. And he wrote a classical paper on unsustainability of, of mountain environments. And it was very revealing. And that's what I, every time Mark comes up with something, and I, I love some of the policy recommendations in there that that need to complement my sort of I suppose my trouble with my talk was much more optimistic than it ought to be <laughs> anyway thank you thank you Mark I uh, thank you both of you let me come back to the room if anybody would like to make any comment or question or reflection and let me take one at a time I begin with the gentleman at the back and if there's a mic coming your way, if you tell us your name and uh, institution, that'd be great. And then I'll come to the lady in the front. Uh, thank you. I'm Jim Michael. I'm with the USAID Alumni Association. Uh, we've heard about the potential of intensifi sustainable intensification. And we've heard about the pattern of unsustainable <laughs> efforts and bad policies. And it seems then that the problem has to be the politics of getting to good policy. And I wonder from your different perspectives, the optimistic and the uh, factual uh, story of, of bad policies in the past, what does it take to see some momentum for change toward uh, this optimistic future, Sir Gordon? Well, I think the simple answer is you need political leadership that works. I mean, you've been able to see what uh, Akin Adesena at the Minister of Agri Agriculture in Nigeria was able to do. I mean, he abolished the, the fertilizer scandal overnight and survived. I mean, otherwise he might not have. Been. I mean, that I think is the answer. And you, there are a number of, of leaders now, uh, presidents of countries, who get this. And you can see... Usman's got a really interesting graph of the effects of CADAP, which shows that, by and large, CADAP has been a success in terms of the countries that have adopted it, or more or less adopted it, right? I'm, I'm simplifying your graph. But the point is that you can get policies created, and Marx talked about a number of those policies, and there are leaders out there now, there are... I was in Rwanda recently, um, there's a number of things wrong with President Kagame, but not wrong with the way in which he's making that country develop economically, and not wrong with the way it's developing in terms of agriculture. Uh, he's got a brilliant new Minister of Agriculture, she got a PhD in bean breeding in uh, Minnesota, and you, on the ground you can see farmers working like entrepreneurs. So you, you, if you've got the leadership there, I think that's it's a sort of necessary but not sufficient condition. But I, I think without that kind of leadership, we don't get anywhere. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and for better or for worse, I think one thing is, is going, going to be driving a, a faster pace of positive change now is that, that these failed policies, and not only the policies, but failures at the micro level as well, are, have become so costly that, that it's much more apparent politically, yeah. uh, that, and uh, that is in a sense going to give ammunition for the, good, the, high, the more effective leadership to move forward these kind of reform plans. Thank you. Let me come to the lady in the front here. Yes, I'm Marilyn Merritt, also here with the USAID Alumni Association. 
I couldn't help, no, uh, I applaud what both of you have said, but, uh, and you did briefly mention the uh, population growth, but of course, one thing that we know from history is that any time we have intensified agriculture, it's resulted in greater population growth, which has been a real problem. And then also, I would say, just based on my own experience living in the Sahel and Niger, one of the problems with degradation is that more land has been put into agricultural service that should not have been put into agricultural service at the expense of other forms of livelihood, such as, you know, nomadic livestock. And I just wonder if you could reflect on those issues. Well, I agree, I agree with your second point. I'm not sure that population growth necessarily results in increased degradation. Uh, you, you've got Examples, for example, Bangladesh is the classic example of countries that have gone about uh, rapid reduction in fertility rates. And despite the fact that the population has continued to grow, as it does, but they, they're getting it down because the fertility rates are going down. That's not happening in Africa. And it's not happening in part because of the cutbacks to um, family planning that occurred under one of the American presidents, who shall be namely, nameless. Uh, that was the problem that's led to this current situation. The large numbers of African women want to control family size, but they don't have the access to do so. Oh, did you want to pass on this one? Okay, let me come next to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Uh, Conway. My name is Dr. Tom Herlihy. I'm working as an independent consultant. Um, I really liked what you were saying about soil, but the one thing I found missing from this presentation is technology, mechanization. Um, I've been on farms working with smallholder farmers for the last 30 years, and we've used the Coke or the Pepsi bottle cap to put fertilizer in the soil in a different hole than the seed, because you don't want to burn the seed, it's backbreaking work. It's backbreaking work, which is why farmers prefer to spread fertilizer by hand like this, and even broadcast seeds. It's backbreaking work. And if you've got a hectare or two hectares, it's really backbreaking work. So I was wondering if you could talk about any innovations you've seen regarding seed drills, mechanical fertilizer placement, We've got backpack sprayers for crop protection products to get rid of herbicides, but I'd like to hear more about mechanization and the fact that there are labor shortages at key times in the agricultural cycle. Thank well, you. You're absolutely right. In, in the longer than 30 minute version of my talk, I do talk a bit about mechanization. And I talk about it because of my experience in Southeast Asia. I mean, there's an enormous uh, wealth of, of information and of the success of two-wheel tractors, for example. And you can see this, there's a, a website comes out of FAO called the two-wheel oh, tractor. To I'm sorry, I was trying to speak to the guy. Um, uh, th there's a, a lot of information comes out of, um, FAO has got a two-wheel tractor, but um, it, it, it clearly there's a real deficiency in Africa of that small-scale mechanization where you've got little machines that can be made locally in local factories. Uh, we've got one project at AATF on mechanization of cassava. Um, what we've done there is to import the machines from Brazil, because that's what we had to do, is to import the machines from Brazil. And now the next stage is to see if we can't find some local manufacturers to manufacture the, 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 the machines. But you're right, it, it's a crucial issue. Mark, do you want to share anything? Just also, the, also that is going to be a betting uh, move towards more mechanization is increasingly uh, uh, the availability of contract services uh, that are, have been developed in, in Asia for years and are, are more so as well in, in Africa now that uh, allows it to be done in economic fashions. Jonathan? Thanks. Uh, I'm Jonathan Wadsworth. I uh, work for both CGIR and the World Bank at the moment. Uh, thanks, Gordon, for your talk. It's the same talk with different titles, and I think that's wonderful because it, it's really developed over the years. I'm really glad also that you've, you've got rid of the question mark and changed the order of the words in the title. <laughs> uh, but 
I was, I thought the, the, the combination of, of your talk with its big panorama and spread of different sustainable intensification examples was a good, was complemented very well by Mark's comments yeah. at the end. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to home in on one of those, because uh, I think it's quite an important issue. And I do realize that saying this in IFPRI may not be popular. Uh, so maybe I'll have to stay at the end and talk a bit look, and have another chat with some people. But when you talked about bad policy resistant technologies or uh, innovations, you put that in, in, in inverted commas as a sort of a tongue in cheek. But I think it's absolutely true. I think it's, it, it's a phenomena. And at the moment in the CGIR, we're looking at a whole new range of research programs and looking at ideas and what to fund and what not to fund. We talk about drought resistance, flood tolerance, pest resistance, etc., disease resistance. We never talk about bad policy resistance. I feel that sometimes we expect the policy work to fix things afterwards, to make the policy environment right for what we've got from research. I think there's another way of looking at this. Make the research right for the appalling policy environment that exists in many places and will continue to exist. So it goes together, it brings the thing full circle. And Gordon will remember when we were, in, we were working in DFID together, we were able to develop some fantastic work on BT brassicas, which never came to fruition, although they were absolutely ready for the market because the policy environment was wrong at the time. So that research was probably about 10 years ahead of its time, but resulted in all that material actually not existing now. So we can, the sequencing of how we do this policy and research, I think need to be far closer uh, hand in hand, rather than doing the research and then hoping that somebody like IFPRI will give good policy advice to governments later down the line. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Mark, do you want to Oh, yeah, I mean, I, so that definitely wasn't meant to be tongue in cheek. It was just, just highlighting those words because they were, look kind of clumsy on the paper. But yeah, I think, I think that's a great suggestion. And, and getting policy uh, al aligned much more early in the process of working together between IFPRI and the other centers uh, is is ideal and hopefully the the next round of the the crps the the cg research programs will help develop that even uh, further so i think that that was a great suggestion thank you i, th I think one of the areas is is in uh infrastructure i mean we you know infrastructure went out of fashion i remember at diffid we didn't like infrastructure when i was there uh, it, it, and yet you only have to i mean the other day in Mozambique, I, I traveled 35 miles and it took three hours along this road because we had, had to keep digging the truck out before we could get through there. And those people were isolated because of that. I think one of the areas of infrastructure that really is important for Africa is, is irrigation. I mean, large-scale irrigation. There's a lot to be done with small-scale irrigation, but only 4% of sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated. Only 4%, for God's sake. You think of Southeast Asia, or Asia as a whole. The difference is enormous. And nobody likes to do irrigation. The economists all say that the rates of return are, are far too small. Uh, but I think in a large number of places in both West Africa and Eastern and Southern Africa, we need irrigation. But it's a question of how do you design it so that it will be sustainable. I mean, it's not just that, it's not just about bad policy, but about making potentially bad policy better policy by doing your engineering in a much better way than you would otherwise do. Um, I have made note of about four different hands that have come up. Let me come first to the gentleman here. I'll come back to the room then, then to the back. Uh, thank you very much. I'm a member for UNESCO Task Force, and for the last 18 months, we've been focusing on identifying what we call best practices. Specifically for agriculture in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, we try to find technologies which can be applied today in a matter of um, inscribing the, the crop cycle and so on. Um, 
so, and then to be able to disseminate uh, these best practices or best technologies. So we collected some of the technologies. One of them is addressing fertilizer, those who can be handled by small farmers today. My question is, what would be the process you advise to whom shall we ask if this technology works, it seems it works very well. How can we find farmers, they experiment it, and then we enable them to use them and to disseminate should be part of the same process. And generally speaking, how important are fertilizers for this? Thank you. Well, fertilizers are crucial. You, 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 you can't get above one ton of, of corn unless you've got fertilizer. But the, the, the answer is through blended fertilizer. Now, the problem is that there are very few little companies that do that now. There's one in, there's one in Kenya. I can't remember where it is, but it's, it's it, the small company that does do the blending. Sorry? It's Nakuru. Nakuru. Mia. Mia. Mia company in Nakuru. And they will... I mean, obviously they're a commercial company, but they will have experience of what is working there. Um, I don't know who... I mean, I don't know whether there's anybody at Yara who's actually... The trouble is that they're not, probably not the best people to go to. But there must be... I have the... I have the impression that the two of you are having a conversation after this uh, seminar. Uh, <laughs> but there may be that. people who can tell you what are the best kinds of... I mean, we know that you have to have the right fertilizer for the right place. I mean, at Rockefeller, I remember we funded a thousand soil sites in Malawi. And we knew what every, every region of Malawi needed in terms of fertilizer and when they introduced the subsidy program it was only for diammonium phosphate just that I mean it's a complete waste of time uh, but there is more experience now it's a good question I don't know who will know best how to make that happen we know what the theory is but who knows the practice maybe okay. we have this conversation but Mark did you want to come in and then I want to go to the other people in there. IFDC has done a lot of work in these areas. They might be worth oh, contacting right. if you know, International Fertilizer Development Corporation. So they, they, they do a lot of work on trying to look at innovative fertilizers and how to get them out. So. Yeah, that's right. Good. And we have several more people who want to make comments, and I probably respond to some of the comments that are made. But let me come to the gentleman here. Thank you very much. My name is Neil Boyle. I'm, uh, I'm here because of the... Uh, I'm an alum alumni of uh, USAID, but uh, I am also, what is unique about my experience is that I am also a 20-year veteran of the World Bank in which I spent uh, those 20 years doing projects. And one of the things that I learned um, is that we do projects very poorly. Uh, we think we do, and we, we come up with a lot of answers for our reports but uh, we do them very poorly, and, and I'm talking from a scientific point of view. So I think the comment of the gentleman who's sitting right in front of me is very apropos, and the comment from the panel as well, in terms of bringing research closer to the, the action, the projects that you're doing. But also, I would um, add that the comment by Sir Conway uh, at the end of his presentation about evaluation, I would bring evaluation into that mix. And uh, from my own personal uh, viewpoint, that I think has to do with the delivery system. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about the delivery system rather than the, the um, very good presentations that we've heard but I've heard it so many times before, I can almost uh, repeat them by memory um, because it's all technical and it's all written down and it's been written down for a long, long time. But the delivery system, what do we know about the delivery system? How does it work? How does it not work? What can we do to improve it? Thank you. Well, I think there's other people in the room would know more. I mean, one of the problems of, of the British experience is that 
we don't do projects anymore at DFID. When I was there, we more or less stopped doing projects. We were giving funding to other organizations to do things. Uh, I think it's quite interesting. I think the answer lies that in the in the design of the project, the practical design of the project, you need to take into account the kind of questions that Mark's been asking. I mean, it seems to me you could take Mark's points and boil them down to what is needed for any individual project. I mean, part of the trouble is that most project design simply consists of ticking a lot of boxes. And, and the dynamics of the project are never properly considered. Uh, and got five minutes. Yeah, you got five minutes. Mark, any words on that's that? That's not a satisfactory answer. Ones, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. And, and it's, yeah, the l delivery question has been complicated by basically the collapse of extension services and in, 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 you know, government extension services in most of Africa and Asia and pr probably Latin America as well. That we really need to design systems that, that take into account the, the, the private sector, those who are actually producing or delivering, whether it's fertilizer or machines or something, NGOs who, who have a local capability and oftentimes are, are close connections with local villages and communities, the farmers associations themselves, as well as, as you know, in some areas, the sort of rudimentary uh, uh, government extension services. So it's a much more diverse uh, uh, set of actors. But I, I think there's a kernel of efficient ways to do that because there's more, uh, in a sense, more of an incentive to do it right, both in the private sector and for those representing the communities. I've just, uh, th there's one good example, which is the One Acre Fund. I don't know if you know about the One Acre Fund. Look, look that up on the web. I mean, that is hundreds of thousands of farmers now in, in Africa, uh, run by an NGO which focuses on farmers who only have an acre or less. And they're producing sustainable livelihoods on those acres. And they're doing it extremely well. And it's very well worked out and planned. And so I would recommend that. You can find them on the web. Let me take a One two, acre fund. I have two questions at the end, at the back over there. And if all of you are very nice and brief, then we take the last three. I also see Carl's hands up there. Uh, Yasmin? So my name is Yasmin, and I'm, a f I'm interested in food policy and, and nutrition issues in Africa. So um, I'm Ghanaian, and in my experience, definitely in intensifying food production in Africa will go a long way to address food security and nutrition issues. But one thing in my experience I've seen is that there hasn't been a lot of effort in reducing post-harvest loss and waste, and we know that that's a big issue in Africa, especially before between you know between uh, production and before reaching the consumer so what do you think in your opinion are some of the research and policy needs that need to happen to to ensure that we are actually reducing post harvest loss and waste and hopefully increasing food security and reducing malnutrition thank you gordon will you permit me to take two more and then yeah, collect sure. them if you're okay and uh, there's paul at the back there uh, yasmin can you pa pass the mic i'm oh, sorry indira can you pass the mic first and then we'll come to the front um, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Eisenman. I'm an independent consultant working most recently on the report of the Education Commission, which was presented to the uh, UN on Sunday. And from that perspective, I uh, thanks for both great presentations. I'd um, like to ask Sir Gordon particularly to comment on the following. What you're talking about in terms of what individual farmers have to do, in terms of what uh, farmers associations have to do, how the private and public sectors work together, these are all very education intensive. And um, you need to have education, educated farmers, or let me put it another way, the more educated the farmer, the more likely they are to be able to do what you want. And then at the higher levels of education, you really need the, the leaders to do all of the other thing. So question to you is, you know, one, do you agree with that? And two, on the scale of all the different things we've been hearing about that have to be done, where would you see, if you have a limited budget, would you put education as uh, low, medium, or high in this process? Thanks. Okay. And then we take the third question or comment. Indira, come back, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm Mike McGurr with USDA's National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, Sir Gordon, on, on your very first slide, 
uh, among those perfect storm crises, uh, you had something that you indicated as moral compass. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more and perhaps provide an idea or two on how we as a community could help develop and promote that moral dimension. Great. So, Gordon and Mark, post-harvest losses, education, well, moral okay. compass. Just on the post-harvest loss, I mean, I think the answer lies in what I was describing with the warehousing. You know, if, if a farmer takes their, their grain and stores it in, the, in their little house or in a shed in the village, after a few months, all you've got is, is rats and mice and bugs. You don't have any grain. If within a couple of days of harvest, it goes to a warehouse, the waste is virtually zero. So we need more warehouses where the grain will go to. On education, uh, yes, it, it's very high. It, it, it's, it's a key component. But I'm not sure we necessarily know exactly what kind of education is needed. Uh, in, in Rwanda, where the education is pretty good, I saw these middle school leavers who were being trained as entrepreneurs by TechnoServe. And 12 of them had set up a cooperative. And they were, they were straight out of middle school. They'd set up a co-op that was selling seed potato. But they'd got enough education to do that well. And I thought that was great. Moral compass, we could be here forever. But I mean, crucially, moral compass is about it's an assumption that you have an inner sense of what's right and what's wrong. It's first defined by Cicero, actually, but of course it's there in nearly all religions. Uh, there's a sort of innate sense about what's right and what's wrong. And, and you can see that that's breaking down in the world today. Things are happening, being done by leaders who ought to know better, who ought to have applied a sort of basic principle of moral compass about what's right and what's wrong. And that fuels all kinds of things. So go, go back to Cicero. You can read about it in, let's just say you could, no. Just go to Cicero. <laughs> Mark. In the Latin, preferably. <laughs> Yeah. I'll just add to the post harvest losses. Yeah, a, 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 a big part of the solution is the kinds of uh, technologies that, that uh, Gordon mentioned, the you know, small scale storage, uh, there, there's innovative uh, bags, that, uh, moisture resistant bags that are, that are being spread, uh, small sensors that, that track uh, uh, spoilage and can help, help trigger uh, appropriate action. And, and that, but those things to, to be spread more broadly do then require this uh, additional investment in, in roads, railroads, and so forth as well. Yeah. So that combination yeah. of private initiative and, and public sector investment. So. So this was an absolutely fascinating uh, set of uh, discussion over here. I am so sorry I am going to have to bring this part to a close. I know I see a hand waving frantically at the back. 30 second comment, please, and then we come to our closing. Not, not frantically, but thank you. Okay. Anyway, John Lewis, many of you know me. Uh, in the last century, I was on the oversight committee of the CGIAR when I was at USAID. And in those meetings, Gordon, you were in many of them, uh, we discussed the orphan crops. These tended to be perennial crops, which makes them climate smart and forest friendly. And we still don't hear about them. And in an even formerly former life, earlier in the century, I had a number, I did a doctorate in anthropology, we had a lot of archeology, span and basically annual crops leave behind deserts almost all the time, except in parts of Asia where going back uh, before, well, in the BC years, they had a forest policy where you got killed by the emperor if you cut trees above 1,000 meters. And there you still have watersheds that feed irrigation systems. But where you didn't have a forest policy, you don't have any trees in those watersheds, and so the irrigation systems don't have water. So this orphan crop thing is a real concern. They're perennial crops, and in our life, in my current 
uh, activities with Red Plus, we encounter a lot of resistance from African and sometimes Latin American governments because these crops are pretty much controlled by women and you're handing a lot of the food security equation over to women, which you don't with annual cereals crops, which show up in World Bank numbers and granaries that are protected by Patrick clans. And somebody's got to hit the head on. And if not you, who? We went back a lot of centuries in that. <laughs> I, I, I'm rather hopeful that the imperatives of climate change and the need for adaptation is going to make us much more interested in so-called orphan crops. I mean, there are, for example, beans that will withstand up to uh, uh, very high temperatures, 50, 50 degrees or more, 50, 60 degrees. Uh, and some of those are now being cultivated. There are collections uh, in the CG systems of a range of genetic material that you would class as being orphan crops. It, it's, it's, it's making sure you've got an orphan crop that is relatively easy to manage and will give you some kind of return. And I think it's, I think it's more likely now to happen. I agree it hasn't happened. But I think climate change is going to, climate change and in particular drought and high temperature is going to make us hunt more for those kind of crops. That's not much of an answer, but it's the best I can do.